Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and MeWe. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. He's been doing the exact same thing for weeks. Carrying her ashes everywhere with him like a freaking weirdo. I've been seeing her. Laura. She's gone, man. You've got to do what we need to do to put her to rest and move on. Damn it, damn it! What? I want to report a stolen car. Bro, shampoo. From the scatter you were, we were the happiest. Chicago is the answer. Am I dreaming? You're not dreaming. Me is dead. I guess I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Sir, look! Where's Des Moines? That this way. way. I'm lost. Or my ashes are anyway, and my whole family wants you arrested. Bro, shame. Um, I'm sorry about that too, right now. I can't do anything with sorry. Action, Ted! I'm just gonna... Yeah, I know you've come a long way. Don't do it. About tombs or gods or monuments. Happiness for us was a complicated. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 361. Releasing August 3rd on video on demand and digital is Monuments, a dramatic comedy that follows a young widower who steals his wife's ashes and sets off on a road trip from Colorado to Chicago with the spirit of his dead wife as company. A film that deals with grief, loss and family dysfunction in its own unique and heartfelt way, Monuments is the latest film from director Jack C. Newell, who I'm glad to say joins me now on the podcast. Jack, I thank you so much for joining me today. Uh very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So reading up about monuments in your career as well, um, interesting to find that the genesis of this film came from two very unique and distinct places. Um, first off, you dealt with loss yourself in your in your late teens with the passing of your with your mother and your brother, which I'm very sorry to, to have read about. And also there was a short story that your mother-in-law wrote as well. And it's kind of like the amalgamation of these two ideas kind of made the, the foundation from how monuments kind of got started how did those two things um, especially in regards to the short story from your mother-in-law kind of really started this whole kind of uh, process of making monuments well yeah uh, that's well re- recounted and, and that is the that is sort of the the two generation points i was newly married uh, to my now wife and my mother-in-law was like hey, i got the short story and it was about a newly married couple who you know they're at dinner and they say She's like, oh, if I died, you're just having a conversation. If I died, I'd love to be scattered at this museum. And she ends up dying, and he ends up breaking this museum and scattering her ashes. It's a very, very simple story. It's like five pages. It's not heavy on character or details. It's almost like a sketch for a story in a lot of ways. But I read it, and it really affected me. And I think it's because of just where I was at in my life and um, also like having had this previous experience with loss. And when I read it, I was like, there's a beginning, middle, and end here, and there's enough here, I think, for me to play in in this world of of grief and try and find a way to explore these ideas and these emotions that I've felt in my journey with with grief, um, because I've got the like beginning, middle, and end essentially provided by the story, and so that's really how we got to 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 monuments. I, I imagine dealing with loss like that, especially at the age you were at the moment at that time. Sorry. Um, would have just really formed you as as a person and to as you are today. Does it also form the way that you approach your work and your stories as well? Is grief very much a part of, you know, how you approach character and story? Yeah, I don't know if I'd say it's grief. I, I, maybe it's a semantics or getting caught up in it. But I would say, you know, one thing that's interesting is that, like, I was when I even tell the story, I just am realizing when you ask that, like, I was newly married and then thought about all the grief, you know, and thought about all the death in my life, which I think that's probably more 
absolutely how I look at it, where it's like, here's this happy moment, and I'm sort of in the back of my mind because I've dealt with this. I'm thinking like, oh yeah, but it, you know, you could lose it, it could end, you know. Which is, um, if you if you if you spend too much time on that, it's incredibly unhealthy. Um, I guess I'm lucky, luckily, a filmmaker because I can then make films to talk about this sort of stuff. Yeah. But I think that that is how I see it. But that that cuts the other way too. I think we're actually more common. I think we, we find ourselves interacting more with like, here's a happy moment. What, what if it was sad? But I think one of the things in monuments that I'm trying to explore and in some other film work maybe is like, here's something that's like categorically sad. And where is the humor in that? Mm -hmm. I think is what makes this film a little bit more um, challenging for some audiences, but also engaging and deeper. And, and as you said up top, it sort of sticks with you because if you've dealt with loss, whether you've lost a loved one, or even if you're just dealing with like, you know, after this year and a half of COVID of like who we used to be or who you used to be, um, it's sad, you know, when you think back, but there's also, there's, it's much more than just that one dimensional, sad, happy. It's, it can be sublime. It can be silly. It can be, you know, um, funny it can be all of insane it can be all of these things and that's what we was trying to explore in monuments it's interesting watching the movie thinking back reflecting on it it's almost kind of like kind of like a coming of age movie you've got the character mm -hmm. of of ted daniels who when you first meet him you know he's his marriage isn't the strongest he's you wouldn't necessarily call him a fighter either both physically i guess and symbolically in any, any sort of way and it, it kind of took the death of his wife to kind of get him to to do something with his life and which kind of spurned, spurned him on to take on this adventure. I, would a coming of age story be kind of, kind of like a bit of a, a description of how you might approach uh, Ted's narrative as a character? Absolutely. You can hit the nail on the head. Again, I think when we talk about coming of age stories, we always think of like a teen, right? Um, and I think in my experience so far, like people are always coming of age, you know, mm. I think we're always, we are different to today who we were yesterday and tomorrow will cha have changed again. And I think Ted is definitely all of those things. And it does take this thing to happen um, for him to get pushed into, you know, pushed into action and to him dealing with, with it. And that's, you know, one of the ways in which the film operates where he's, he is sort of stuck and he's not a person who does it. And I don't think he becomes a different person by the end of the movie, but I think, you know, what I learned, I guess, quote unquote, from like the loss I've I've suffered in when I was younger is that like it can all just go away. Like you have to really appreciate, you know, what you have when you have it and try to be present in the moment um, and, uh, because it just you just you'll be fast. It'll be shocking how fast things can change. Um, and that's the sort of journey that he goes on, I think, to a certain extent, too. Teddy's played by David Sullivan, um, which so, some people might remember him from the movie Primer. Um, yeah. How did you come across David in um, having him in your movie? Because you are a Chicago-based filmmaker. A lot of your cast is from Chicago. Ted is uh, from Texas, isn't he? Well, he's originally from Texas, but he, he's in L.A. now. Same with okay. Marguerite and uh, Javier is in New York. Excellent. And how did you find, uh, how did um, David um, kind of, um, sorry, um, David Sullivan come along to uh, play the role of Ted. Yeah, so uh, the the way it goes is like you sort of go out to these agencies with your casting director, and and the first thing they ask is like, when are you shooting? And so we had our dates, and then they start to send folks your way, and you know we had a lot of submissions, and David was one of them. And I had seen Primer was big for me right after film school, and so that was definitely like oh. And then having seen the work he'd done since then, it's interesting. You you. You start to the casting process, whether you do it that way that I just described, or even if you just have auditions, it's weird because like it's it's been in your head or it's been on paper or it's been this like sort of thing. But then when someone's like, I am going to play Ted, um, and they start to put it either they audition for you and they put it in their words, or you watch, you know, you know, you watch footage of them because David didn't audition for this. Um, they just sent the headshot in, and then you you sort of start watching the movie with them in mind. And then as soon as I saw David. I remember I was walking up the stairs to my apartment and I had gotten his thing earlier in the day and was just busy and hadn't been thinking about it. And then I just was walking up the stairs and I remembered something that he did in an episode of flakes. And I was like, he's Ted, like hmm. he has to be dead. I just, it just like locked in for me in a way. I was like, Oh my God, like this movie can't be, 
I cannot even cast anyone else in the movie, even if I could. Like, this has got to be the guy because he gets because it's a hard part. I mean, it's a really hard part because he has to be able to be a convincing romantic lead. He has to be able to convincingly do straight up drama. He's also doing action, slapstick, witty comedy. Um, he's doing it all. I mean, this is like a master class in acting styles by David Sullivan because he has to do all of these different things. And he, most importantly, him, and I would say, all, I would say everyone, but, you know, we'll talk about the leads, you know, him, Javier and Marguerite do it completely organically and completely believably where in one minute he can be crying on the floor believably and the next minute dancing in a musical number convincingly. And that, is very complicated. I, you know, not everyone can do that. David could. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by 80s Tees. 80s Tees is an online retailer of licensed t-shirts and pop culture gear from your favorite movies, TV shows, cartoons, video games, comic books, and musicians. Celebrate your inner 80s nerd and click on the link in the show notes below to get the raddest retro t-shirts delivered to your door. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is brought to you by Loot Crate. Founded in 2012, Loot Crate is the worldwide leader in fan subscription boxes. Loot Crate partners with industry leaders in entertainment, gaming, sports, and pop culture to deliver monthly themed crates, produce interactive experiences in digital content, and film original video productions. No matter what you geek out about, Loot Crate has a subscription box for you. To get your very own exclusive collectibles, apparel, and gear delivered to your door, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. The Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast is also brought to you by Voodoo. Watch the latest movies and TV shows anytime, anywhere. No subscriptions, no contract. Enjoy stunning quality in up to 4K ultra high definition at home and download and watch on your mobile device as well. To rent and buy from over 100,000 titles or watch thousands of movies free with Voodoo Movies on us, be sure to click on the link in the show notes below. Now, back to the show. You know, the, the in- interesting thing about marriage is that you're not only marrying a person, you're essentially marrying their fam- f- marrying their family as well. Um, and that can come across and that can lead to all sorts of different uh, results. And uh, the thing about this movie is that the... Uh, character of Laura, who uh, plays um, Ted's uh, deceased wife, she has a very eccentric family. Um, 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 I, I imagine that, well, the question is, considering the intimate nature of, of the story and, and where it came from for you, the very personal nature, the, the, the family of uh, Laura's family, are they in any way inspired by people that you know or, or anyone that you've heard of before? Because it's just so uh, unique in the way that they are shown on screen. Well, there's a couple of different ways that that sort of comes together one is you know this film is is a journey it's a road trip obviously but it's also ted's every single person he comes in to contact with or every group of people he comes into contact with are presenting to him and then to the audience the quote-unquote the way you're supposed to grieve as they Mm. view the world and so every single person that he's interacting with, because he doesn't know, he, he he's not sure. He doesn't know what is the quote unquote right way to, to do this. He doesn't know. And that because he doesn't know, that's why he's stuck and he's just carrying her ashes around everywhere. And that's why he's like, I'm going to take you to this museum because that's where we were happy because he he's so devastated and so doesn't know how to even handle it that, that that's what he chooses to do. And so the entire movie is almost like, a position paper or like a thesis on like, here's all the different ways people grieve. And so the family, I didn't want to get into religion in this film because it just didn't feel, I just didn't want to get into it. That's the simplest version. They sort of stand in for religion by having traditions. This, the way you're supposed to grieve is this way because of the the rules. Right. And then Mm -hmm. Amber, someone who's just stuck in time and the sirens are people who do not care about anything. They have completely like, they have no sense of time that nothing matters at all. And Joel, at the museum is like put it behind glass and keep it you know preserved and howell is the most like overtly alpha masculine or if you don't even want to get into masculine feminine just like performative i am sad you know this is how you're supposed to grieve sort of thing and then there's ted uh, and laura um and sort of navigating their way through it so that's sort of a larger context answer to your question um because of that the family sort of 
is who they are. I mean, they aren't specifically anyone to be completely honest, but they're just a lot of different people who I, I know um, that are sort of smashed together. It's definitely, you know, my going back to my history, like my, my dad had, um, had an aneurysm when I was young, when I was like 11. Mm -hmm. And so that basically like, and it sort of took him out of, he was around, but his brain was all, you know, he was just not the same. Um, and my mom was very strong willed. And so like that, I definitely looked to like those two characters as like my mom and dad, who's like a very strong willed, um, wife with a very, 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 uh, submissive sort of husband. And then, um, Crystal, I can't tell you where she came from, but she might be my favorite character, like in the movie, like the secret favorite character in the movie. Um, because she just, she just did such a wonderful job with it and brings so much humanity to, a, you know, sort of a bad, bad guy role almost. Um, the first thing that hits me when I watch Monuments is the score. Um, and uh, your composer of your film, in apologies for any mispronunciation of names, is, was um, Nick Takanobu Agawa. Um, as soon as that score kind of hit me, I was just like taken, kind of taken aback by it because in a certain sort of way, especially in the opening frames when the score hits, it kind of kind of sounds like a Western, kind of like those classic Westerns. Um, right. um, is that what you were going for with those, especially in the more kind of adventure elements of the film with that score kind of hits? Yeah, I mean, just uh, if you watch this this opening when this score and then you watch the opening to Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo, um, you'll you'll know exactly where I got it from. I can just say that. Um, and it, it's, it's absolutely a Western. I mean, this film is, I view this film as a Western. I mean, I pulled a lot from the man who shot Liberty Valance in a lot of ways, because it's mm -hmm. like the two ideals of, a, of what is man, like the John Wayne man or the, or the, um, Jimmy Stewart man. Um, and this, uh, really on, in a lot of ways, the main character, like the woman in between. Um, and so, there's a lot of Western stuff and there's a lot of other polls as well of, you know, films, whether it be uh, Spielberg with Indiana Jones or it's, um, or it's Kurosawa or some of these other ones. But yeah, I think w when we were making the film, you know, it's a very small story. It's about two people. It's a relationship movie about Ted and Laura, but it's told on an epic scale. And I really like, thank epics. you for watching. The and if you look, and channel. if you're an independent filmmaker and you don't have a budget of reviews, like millions of dollars to make all the explosions and the blow them ups and all that stuff. And also, maybe let's say you're not even like necessarily overly interested in that. My work, how do you find a way to bring this spectacle for the audience? The and below. you go back and you look to movies from the, you know, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies. And so we're pulling heavily from films from the sixties and seventies. And if you watch how they did it it was like grand vistas it was um letting locate the like beautiful locations sort of like speak which westerns did obviously wonderfully um and it's the score and if you watch old movies or if you even just watch any movie you 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 the score is doing so much heavy lifting in terms of setting that scope and scale and so that was sort of the choice early on of like i want this to have the the thing that's going to make this feel like a, the big movie i want it to be more than anything more than all the explosions in the world is a really big, robust, huge score. And it does. And he did, and you said his name perfectly. He did an amazing job with it. And I, it's such a great score. I can't wait to, to actually, um, if there are soundtracks available to, to get it. Cause I just, I absolutely loved it. Um, I really did. Um, you know, you, we, you, you mentioned road trip before, um, I guess in the sort of way you could call it kind of almost like a chase movie as well on certain elements. Mm -hmm. It's overall it's definitely uh, an adventure vibe. And I think it speaks to a lot about, you know, the movie, the characters of, the, of Ted especially. It's not essentially about the destination. It's, more, it's about the journey, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there's anything I think I've learned so far in life, it's, it's about the journey. It's not the destination, I think. And that's, you know, road trips are about, I mean, I think that, or that's, you know, the, the road trip from the Odyssey to monuments, they're all road trip movies. And it's really about, you know, and in this movie, actually it becomes a thing where like literally the destination <laughs> does not matter. Like he, he messes that part up so bad without giving away anything for the movie. Yes. Like it's literally not the point. Um, but that's, that's the truth too. I mean, it's like, you don't, whenever you tell a story about a journey, it's like you tell the story about the journey. It's not like, and then we got to the place and, and you tell that whole story, like who cares about that? Like it's, it's just about, and I think that it speaks to larger way of viewing life. And I think one of the things about, about um, this film and, and like, how do we view, I mean, how do you view your time on earth and how do you view success and how do you view 
happiness. And it's like, part of it is this, it's less, I think a lot of times we get caught up on like a destination and that could be a metaphorical destination. Like, Oh, I want to have this job or I want to be making this much money or I need to be winning this award or whatever. And they're all, they're just destinations. Um, and I think what the way I try to live and the way I try to make movies is a little bit more focused on like process and focusing and enjoying the process and finding mm-hmm. a way to, to do that. Um, and that has found its way into this, into this film. So for everyone out there listening, August 3rd on video on demand in digital monuments, I recommend everyone check out this film. I think uh, Jack, it's a perfect film for the times we're living in right now. Uh, and I absolutely love it. And like, in the, like I said, the score, I can't wait to get my hands on that when that's available And um, congratulations to you and the movie and uh, best of luck with the upcoming release. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And it was nice to talk with you. Thank you for watching the Matt's movie reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.